from Corolla One Studios in Glendale, California, this is the Adam Corolla Show. Adam's guest today, two-time Peabody Award-winning writer and producer of 60 Minutes, Ira Rosen, and the host of American Nightmare, Murder in a Safe Place, Paul Wagner. With Gina Grad on news and Bald Brian on sound effects, and now he got his first shot today. It was a shot at Don Julio. Adam Carolla. Yeah, get it on. Got to get it on. No choice, we've got to manage to get it on. Thanks for tuning in and thanks for telling a friend. We love that about you, right, Gina Grad? That's right. And Bald Brian. Bald Brian is not on sound effects today. Mmm. <laughs> Um, at uh, the in-laws house it, there's a quarter inch of rain in LA which means of course our power's out so uh, we uh, luckily have Christie's parents close by so we went there where they have internet power heat all those things uh yeah it also uh speaking of LA it's raining out here in LA as Brian just uh, mentioned and uh, as I was driving in in the rainstorm saw the sprinklers going off oh, on the beautiful. side of the freeway and uh you know for me, I don't need to look at every facet of a city or a town. I can just look at little indicators, sort of like when you see someone driving and their car's a mess and there's fast food wrappers stuffed on the dash. You go, okay, that person's Empty water a bottles. little crazy. That, right. that, that's not an orderly person. That's not an efficient person. I don't think I'd like to hire that person. When you uh, drive through a city that never stops talking about droughts, and water conservation, and those uh, sprinklers are just flying away, man. A 10-gun salute. Uh, when it's pouring rain outside, you think, hmm, maybe not the height of efficiency. Uh, appreciate the incongruity of the power grid going down every time there's a quarter inch of rain, yet the sprinklers work, which are presumably powered by electricity. I, I mean, like on a timer? I yes, assume? I guess they are. They could also just get one of those uh, rain sensors on there that have been around for 20 years at Home Depot <laughs> and solve the problem. But it's also it's like it's one of those things, too, where it's like we're always talking about some train or some tunnel or some something. I feel like uh, the power grid should be first and foremost. And then we, yep. you know, if we have time and money left over after that from the tr train from uh, Merced to Modesto or whatever, we'll get to that after we get the power grid updated. Uh, Was it yes. two years ago, whenever I, uh, maybe three years ago, whenever I lived at uh, like Wilshire and Fairfax, I get it. My street went out. It happens. You never know. The entire grove went out the same yeah. day. I left my poor little cousin in a changing room at Forever 21. And the entire grove, which is a giant outdoor mall, we do need to get our shit together. I was thinking about how I was listening to him like, oh, this, this, between the rain and the heat in different parts of the yep. year in LA, the power was out three or four times a year. Like, at least. For not, for not like a flicker, like, oh, your day's ruined. It's also uh, anyone who's lived here their whole life, like I have, It you can count on it. It's going to get oh, yeah. hot during the summer. It's going to be a few rainy days during, like, there's that thing where it's like, well, we got the rolling blackouts because it's 111 degrees outside and everyone's turning on their air conditioning. It's like, right, like it was last shocked? year and then right. the year before. And if you get one of those farmer's almanacs, we can go <laughs> all the way back to before there was electricity and you could set your watch on it. All right. So um, we're living in that city. Um, I don't know. Are we getting to the point where I think L.A. is kind of getting to the point where it's sort of like New York was in the 70s. Like at <laughs> some point, mm. you just want the great Santini to like show up and go, fuck all this. I don't care if people's feelings get hurt. We're getting the shit together. We're working on crime. We're working on homelessness. We're, the power grid, like traffic, like fuck it. I don't care if I hurt feelings. It's not a fucking popularity contest. Uh, we're not going to set aside money for the whatever history museum or whatever. we're just it's all fucking nuts and bolts for five years yes. until we can get this shit up and running. And then we'll see after that if we can get into, you know, um, special special training for teachers to learn about uh, the indigenous people or whatever the fuck it is. Like, let's just fucking nuts and bolts it for a little while. 
Like I'm our, telling you, I had that exact same thought about LA. Or like, we're like New York in the 80s. Like, you know, we're falling apart, there's graffiti everywhere. It's, it's a once great town that is now just falling apart of the seams. And then you always hear the old timers in New York you're grumbling about ah, the Disneyfication of Times Square. That sounds great. That sounds awesome. What I wouldn't give for the Disneyfication of this city, you know, the, the, the spiritual oh, whitewashing, not, you know, racial. Right. Sports, but just clean everything up. Well, you know, and the problem, here's what happens is you get New York in the 70s and you hear about and into the 80s and all the crime and people are getting raped in Central Park and gang violence and, you know, shots fired. You can't fired. go to Times Square. It's yeah. all reflected in every movie. Think about, right. you know, uh, Escape from New York or the, or the, or the Warriors. You know, everything right. in New York is hellscape. Right. And then what happened then and the question is, is can we revisit this what happened then is they go fuck it Giuliani you 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 come in and you do it and he goes all right I'm going to instigate something called stop and frisk and we're just going to stop and frisk anyone who looks dicey any male between this age uh and of a certain color but although that's not the prerequisite for it but we're just going to stop these guys and if they have a fucking gun on them we're going to arrest them if not they can go and then crime goes away, essentially goes away, and he does the broken window thing and all that kind of stuff. But could we implement that? See, we couldn't implement any of that shit anymore because everyone, the same people that were crying about crime would start crying like a stuck pig if we start really implementing things. And look, there's a lot of problems that are sort of uncomfortable. You know what I mean? Like... Stop. You want to stop crime? Stop and frisk is super effective. Uh, well, what about the innocent people who get stopped? Well, this is what happens when you're trying to solve a problem. It's sort of like unaccompanied kids at the border. Like, oh, so these kids should be taken away and put in these facilities, cages or whatever. Because Yes. What what are what is the alternative? If there is a good alternative to this other than just l l set them free in the country, uh, yeah, well, we should do that. But, you know, we're going to break a few uh, eggs to make an omelet here, people. And that's unfortunately kind of how society works. Well, at first, when you asked, are we could we achieve this? My first thought was absolutely not. Have you seen who our D.A. is right. He's going exactly in the other direction? However, are you aware of the fact that there's already a recall against him, at least a petition for a recall against George Gascon? Yeah, <laughs> that, I mean, he, he was hardly here, but everything is so, you know, I don't know who it was. Somebody on KFI called in and I, I didn't get his name, but he made such a good point. He said, you know, I'm all for, you know, second chances, but I'm not for re-victimizing the victim over and over and over again, letting the same person out, uh, you know, letting that person off the hook when this person's not going to get their family member back. You can't keep re-victimizing the victim and the victim's family over and over again. Um, on a separate note, um, I watched Lost in America, the Albert Brooks movie, mm -hmm. with my uh, son last night. It's nice. Oh, interesting. How when, they when they get old enough, it's a goddamn funny movie. It just is. Sonny was laughing the whole time. Uh, the first half is stronger than the second half, but it's still a really funny movie. And what Albert Brooks doesn't really get credit for is he takes a kind of philosophical approach to his comedy like it's about a couple that is in the model of, in the middle of like remodeling a house they got a new house and you know he's up for he's up for promotion and he wants to get to uh vice president of the advertising firm he works for and she's kind of climbing her julie haggerty by the way is right. climbing her Airplane. her corporate ladder and at some point he doesn't get his promotion and he just comes home and he goes like, fuck it. What are we doing? And, mm -hmm. uh, and it, it's a philosophical thing, which is like, they're just climbing and climbing and climbing and nothing's ever enough. I, I don't know why I just love the goddamn conversation he has, um, with the, uh, I think it's Hans, the guy from Mercedes. I don't know. It always, it, it's, God, you can find that the, conversation as he's on the speakerphone and Hans is, is like a thick vinyl. Uh, yeah. Uh, he's like Mercedes leather. So he's like $44,700 all in, 
all in. That's a lot for a car. He's like ordering his new car because he thinks he's getting a promotion. And uh, Hans is like, it's everything but the leather. He's like, no leather? It's it's Mercedes leather. Like, I don't know. If finding those weird nuanced moments is what really makes Albert Brooks uh, a genius in in my belief, but also the sort of psychology of we're going to drop out, see how much we can get in other parts of the country for the money that we're spending for our houses. We can get a house with a pond, a pond in it, you know, and you know, then they get the, then they get the, uh, the Winnebago and they're going to go right. see the country, but there's a, a funny kind of symbolic thing where they're, they're playing um, born to be wild by Steppenwolf and he's in the Winnebago and his whole life is essentially let's just do what they did in easy rider. We'll just do that, you know? And, and he's going along the freeway and this guy pulls up a biker, like pulls up next to him on the one ten, and he looks at him and the biker like looks at him and, Albert Brooks gives him like the enthusiastic <laughs> thumbs up and the biker just flips him yeah, off. He's like, like he's like, like fuck want, you. you. <laughs> right, right. It's, it's like, it was all kind of captured in that one exchange. You're not us. We're miserable too. And uh, then they just go off and she, she loses the nest egg in, um, in Vegas. And then they basically just go back to the corporate world begging for their jobs back. It's, it's so funny. <laughs> Would you equate this, as a comedy to defending your life because defending your life is one of my favorite movies in the world but uh, this movie stresses me out i've seen it twice <laughs> i'm just like uh, it's too stressful i don't i don't like like watching this movie um it 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 has a lot of the same themes you know like yeah. what what is it all about you right. know kind of thing and what are we really doing here and probably themes that albert brooks probably wrestles with or thinks about uh i find them both I find Defending Your Life inspirational and, and people should go back and watch that film now because it's really about not being scared. And if yep. there's yeah, that's that is what it's about. <laughs> there's been a, a theme for the last year in this country. I think fears uh, a big theme, big theme for me. So watch that. But Lost in America is just it's just funny. And um, <clears throat> and then also I was thinking about Julie Haggerty. Uh, I love I, Julie Haggerty. I think I think as a culture we're a little dismissive about her. I don't I don't I feel like she gets her yeah. due. Yeah. She's poignant, she's funny in this film. Like she's good. She's she was she was a, a great part of airplane. Like if you're of gonna course, be in yeah. in airplane and in Lost in America in a five year span or seven year span, you've done you've been in two of the funniest movies of the decade. And and with Airplane, I don't think, I think you're right. I don't think she gets her due because she's playing dumb, but mm-hmm. she's playing it so perfectly. It's that it's do. Exactly. It, it, she's not just, I mean, that is a character she's playing and she's playing it effortlessly. She was great in the Ryan Reynolds and Anna Ferris movie, Just Friends, as the mom. She's fantastic. <laughs> she's a great comedic actress. Yeah, she's a great comedic actress who gets... She gets a little uh, Dolly Partonized, Gina. Like we can't see beyond the tits and the rhinestone or something yeah. to realize there's an, a really talented person there. Yeah. I, it, you know what? It's funny you say that because I was just about to say, you know how Dolly Parton says yeah. it takes a lot of effort to look this cheap? Well, it takes a lot of smarts to play that dumb as Julie Agerty does. Yeah, she's great. She never she never gets mentioned in your sort of pantheon of you know, comedic, you know, Tina Fey would get mentioned right. 10,000 times. Catherine before. O'Hara. Yeah. They'd all get mentioned before she wouldn't even make the list, but she's really talented and she's really effective in these movies. Uh, Chris, do you have Mercedes leather? This is, I'm still a, scrubbed. I've, I personally have not seen this movie, so I, what I know. <laughs> Could your, ba- uh, it's, it's about, eh, it's probably about 15, 20 minutes in when he's, it's early in the he's movie. on a, conference call with uh, Hans from Mercedes. But it's also funny because Albert Brooks always does something funny with, I shouldn't say always, but the Mercedes leather thing is funny. (laughs) And it's also funny when he's working as a crossing guard later and a guy pulls up in the Mercedes and he (laughs) puts his head in and sniffs it. And it's like, that's his moment of, I got to get back to society. But it also, if you watched uh, Defending Your Life, there's a super funny exchange with him in the BMW dealership. 
mm-hmm. where he's showing up at the BMW thing and being sort of devastated. So there's something, it's funny, he has two high-end German manufacturers mm-hmm. and he has a funny, each movie has a really funny kind of scene that it doesn't need to be in any movie. I mean, it's yeah. it's it's not integral to the, to the movie at all. There's just something, he must have had some experiences buying expensive cars right. and 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 as a comedic mind probably took note of it um, well, in the 80s those you know if you had a mercedes or a beamer you you made it that was it that was the status symbol you you achieved a level yeah you were i yuppie. know i know now everyone just has a prius you can't <laughs> tell the winners from the losers anymore out on the road it's tough yeah it's probably it's probably about 15 minutes in and he uh he goes into his office and uh he walks in and he's waiting for his big his big meeting for with the guy from Ford. All right, uh, so Chris can look for that. I was uh, I had some fun because um, I told you guys I had uh, dinner with John Popper from uh, Blues Traveler the other week, and so uh, I'd been listening to some Blues Traveler and just enjoying it. To really, you really want to see Blues Traveler shine, watch them live, like watch sure. some footage of those guys playing live. And then watch watch him. But I thought, so I told Chris last week, I said, uh, find me uh, 30 seconds of Bob Dylan playing the harmonica. <laughs> and then find me 30 seconds of um, John, John Popper, Popper playing, the, uh, playing the harp. And then also, I left a little tail on it because, and Dawson, you, you could probably figure this out. Seems like he blows his fucking lungs out playing the harmonica, and then he goes right off the harmonica into big time belting out singing. And I don't know where he's getting his air from. Well, playing the harmonica is both breathing in and out. Mm-hmm. So it's, you know, yeah, he sounds like he's blowing the hell out of it as he is, but he's also sucking the hell out of it. I guess so. And uh, so his air yeah. intake, is, he goes is right off. Fine. He goes yeah. right off of that yeah. uh, thing, right on. So I'll play a twenty seconds of Bob. It's a different. It's an unfair comparison, but uh, that's <laughs> a different what, vibe. That's what we do here. So like that. It, and take me disappearing. All right. And but he's an icon, but he bothers me. And I always <laughs> love when I talk to John Popper about uh, Bob Dylan. And he's like, oh, that guy sucks as a harmonica <gasps> player. He's fucking wow. horrible. <laughs> I love this squirrel sniper, man. I love this John Popper vibe. I, uh, yeah, pop shots at uh, Dylan and, and at squirrels. Yeah. All right, I'll play you uh, 20 seconds of uh, 30 seconds of uh, him live, John live. So killer.
think Bob Dylan could do that last three second part where he just goes in and out. <laughs> um, and I always think about like the bass player in Blues Traveler. These guys met in high school. Like, how fucking stoked are you if you play the bass in high school and you run into John Popper? Yeah. <laughs> like, you don't it's think like, much of the time. Oh, uh, this is going to be fuck. I mean, you could be playing in a wedding band or you could mm-hmm. get this guy could want, <laughs> wander into your life and go, fucking A, just stand out there with your belt of harmonicas and sing and play your ass off. And I'll just be laying down a kind of rudimentary bass slick behind you that probably so there were probably 13 guys in John's high school that could have played the bass in that band. No offense if you're listening, but I mean, let's face it. A lot of guys can play the drums a little in high school and, you know, play the bass guitar and stuff like that. But Jesus Christ, that guy wanders in and he writes songs and he yeah. sings your, like that. Like, oh, it's your wagon. Fucking a. Nice. Makes you wonder how many guys are out there in like garage bands or wedding bands or whatever who are just as good, if not better, a bass player or drummer or what keyboardist, whatever. But they, the guy went to high school with John Popper. I you know, would, one of the most gifted, you know, uh, harmonica players, frontmen, uh, songwriters. I would bet that you could take most guys who are working on cruise ships. And coach them up a little, show them the music, you know, tell them, you know, play them a couple of songs and they could they could handle the bass. Yeah. Or even the drums or whatever. Not that they're not a tight band and they're an awesome band and they play well together. But I mean, it, it is the luck of the draw yeah. that you got some fat 17 year old kid who was basically he he told me that he was like <clears throat> in in band. He's like in band class. And uh, they wanted him to play the, uh, I don't know, the French horn or the something. And the the band coach, the band leader in high school was like, eh, you're not that, eh, eh, we seem better or whatever. And then at some point he just walked in, he was like in junior band or something and he brought his harmonica and he said like, uh, let me. Let me this show you what, really I, what, I, what I can do with this. And they heard him and they were like, holy shit, you're moving. We're moving you up to advanced band. And, and all they just immediately saw what he could do with the yeah. harmonica. Uh, don't we all wish we had one of those moments? Fuck yeah. I'm still waiting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the day is young. Somebody plucks you out of the chorus. Yeah. Well, you just reach in your pocket and you pull out a harmonica and you go, yeah, you don't think I'm much good on the flugelhorn, huh? Okay. Well, let me try this thing instead. And then you just, everyone sits up and turns and looks at mm-hmm. you and the men are fearful and the women are weeping. <laughs> lustful. They're lustful and it's like fucking playing the shit out of something you've Truth mastered. Told, I'm not much of a flautist. However. <laughs> However. Harmonica. Yeah. I don't know if DJ Khaled has ever uh, had one of those, <laughs> had one of those moments. All right. So uh, we love... Uh, where is that scene, Max? We're, we're pulling it up. It actually doesn't exist as a standalone scene on the internet, so we had to get the whole movie. Oh, and, and, that and, and is do it. that yeah, is just, horrible. Hey, do yourself a favor, watch the rest of it. Yeah, watch the yeah, Chris, watch the whole damn movie there. And you know what? People really enjoy this movie. Uh huh. Yeah. So, like, next time you have a a gig, yeah, you guys play for like ninety minutes. The movie's ninety minutes. Yeah, but but just play the movie. Yeah. Uh, people want to have a good but, time. But if we play the movie, then we. But, can't but people play leave the, the house. The they want to enjoy themselves. Think of the smiling faces you'll see back. Yeah, looking at you. That's right. Yeah. Everyone will stay. It'll be awesome. <laughs> I, 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 look, I'm spitballing <laughs> here. Stay. I'm just I'm spitballing. I'm not telling you how to run your band. Right. Okay. All right. Now look, you got the Offspring book. Obviously, that's a. Uh-huh. It's a different situation. Okay. Uh, just, we'll think play. It. just think about it. That's all. Okay. This is Hans. Hold on, please. Gee, I've been holding most of the morning. Thank you, dear. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, this is Hans. Hans. Yeah. David Howard. How are you, David? Okay, listen. Yeah. Uh, I'm closing in on a decision. Good. I think the beige is the best interior. Good interior there. Uh-huh. And uh, I think with the dark brown, that's... That's the best combination. That's the most beautiful combination on the lot. All right, so tell me again, 
everything, everything, tax, license, out the door, in my garage. Right, well, I don't know where your garage is, but it's $44,420. Wow. All right. It's a lot of money for a car, isn't it? It's not a car, Mr. Howard. It's a Mercedes, and that's the difference. No, I know okay. it's a Mercedes, but it's just still a lot of money. Well, maybe you shouldn't buy the car, then. Get a Nova. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Now, there's no extras, right? That's it. That's everything. I don't imagine at that price I'd have to add. No, just leather. That's all you'd have to add. Nothing else. Really? Yeah. It doesn't come with leather. No, sir, it does not. That's why I told you you'd have to add it. Well, what's in there? Well, it's what they call Mercedes leather. What would that be? Well, it's a very thick vinyl. Beautiful seat. I would prefer that. So let's call it that, then. Fine. Beautiful, thick vinyl seat. But I have it. Gee, isn't that something? Wouldn't you think there'd be leather in there? I tell you what. If you buy the car, I'll put some shoes in it, okay? Okay. All right. So. Well... Uh-huh. All right, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I will see you when? Tomorrow night? Well, I don't know. I'm going to think about it, talk about it with my wife. It's a pretty I big decision. I love this line. Okay, now, how about Friday morning? I, I don't think I can commit to any day right now. Certainly well, not you're this lose week. the car, you know. I have uh, stars coming in here looking at the car. Let me just call you back, all right? <laughs> Hold car, on a second. Be I'm being I buzzed. Guess. Hold on. All right. Here. Yeah. He has stars coming in looking at the car. <laughs> I don't know why. Sonny started laughing his ass off. I, it made me laugh, too. I, don't, I have stars coming in looking at the car. I, I have a <laughs> Generic <question>. stars. <laughs> um, I, I can look this up in a second, but would you be surprised, because suddenly I wouldn't, if Albert Brooks was playing Hans? I was just looking that up to see if it, his it credit It said Hans like, was played by Hans, a guy named I think Hans it's Albert, something. I think it's Albert I think it's, Brooks. I think it's Albert Brooks, too. That was my first thought when I heard that. It, it maybe it is. You guys are um, you, you guys. We know where the Sticks River is. We know what Cookie meant. <laughs> now there's a lot of revelations going on this year. Um, I saw in the credits Hans was played by Hans somebody. Now who the fuck knows what that means? I don't know. Here's here would be my only argument in the credits. I do not think the DGA or the Writers Guild or AFTRA or whatever, I don't know if they would let you make up a name. You know what I'm saying? Like, they got really weird rules for credit and credit buy and whatever. Now, Steven there's... Steven Soderbergh did a movie mm -hmm. where he went by a pseudonym. Can we look that up? Yeah, I just don't... I'm curious about the credits. Like, credited actors, when they roll it at the end, if they would let you monkey around but it's mm. interesting maybe they did it was well, well it's easy because it's played by hans somebody and we well, could see if hans somebody was wagner, an actor wagner uh that's what the imdb looks. oh hans wagner yeah. oh now that does seem like as it's in, brooks yeah as in here as comes in, the bride yeah or f uh flight of the valkyries or right. whatever yeah. right oh well maybe Maybe mm. Hans Wagner. Yeah. There, in one of our favorite movies, Adam, there's an example mm -hmm. of messing with the credits. When uh, in Fargo, uh, one of the shooting victims uh, early in the movie, remember the car that turns over and they get shot by uh, yep. uh, Buscemi's uh, sidekick? <coughs> out in the, out in the middle Peter, of nowhere. Peter Stromer. One of them is credited, strangely enough, as a sideways prince symbol. Oh, that makes really? Makes no sense. But huh. that's, what, well, that's, that's what it is. There's so. precedent for it. Well, I don't know. We can see that Easter egg if that's him or not. But I don't know about that scene. <laughs> I love the fact that he's ordering brown on brown. It's yeah. like, that's yeah. the most attractive. That's, that's the, the best, best one of the lot. The best one of the lot. <laughs> <laughs> I just like the generic stars are coming in to look <laughs> at it. <laughs> not celebrities. He's got Star, a bunch of stars. stars. He's got stars coming by. <laughs> <laughs> He'll throw in a pair of shoes. <laughs> so it's leather. I just love I don't know why that exchange just makes me goddamn laugh. All right, let me tell you about uh, Lightstream. How much interest are you paying on your credit cards every month? Too much? Consolidate your credit cards into one payment at a lower fixed rate and start saving money. It's easy with a credit card consultation loan from Lightstream. Rates start at just 5.95% APR with uh, auto pay and excellent credit. Get a loan from uh, 5,000 to 100,000 bucks with absolutely no fees and you can get your money as soon as the day you apply. Well, that seems fast. Apply now, get special interest rate at discount and save even more. Only way to get this discount is to go to lightstream.com slash Adam. That's L-I-G-H-T-S-T-R-E-A. 
A m.com slash Adam, right, Dawson? Subject to credit approval. Rates range from 5.95% APR to 19.99% APR and include 0.5% auto pay discount. Lowest rate requires excellent credit. Terms and conditions apply and offers are subject to change without notice. Visit lightstream.com slash Adam for more information. Well, we'll talk some uh, true crime with Paul Wagner. Or it could mm. be Wagner. <laughs> Now, what do you think if we look for Hans Wagner? I look. I'm looking like he and there's IMDb, no no. I mean, he has two other <clears throat> credits and one's like a a TV short that's not in English and it's yeah, it's just really no. small. Keep so, in I mean, mind also, Chris, that much of IMDb is user like a Wikipedia. You know what I mean? Someone could yeah. make that connection. Like I don't know if Hans Wagner, this this made up person, manages his own IMDb. Well, page, let's. Or- Let's hear let's hear part of that again. Let's hear that exchange again. And this time let's picture Albert Brooks yep. doing the other voice. Because now I think if you put it in your you'll head, it. maybe you'll maybe you'll see it. David. Okay, listen. Yeah. Uh I'm closing in on a decision. Good. I think the beige is the best interior. interior there, huh? And uh, I think with the dark brown, that's that's the best combination. That's the most beautiful combination on the lot. All right, so tell me again. Uh-huh. Everything, everything, tax, license, out the door, in my garage. Right, well, I don't know where your garage is, but it's $44,420. Wow. Yeah. All right. Mm-hmm. It's a lot of money for a car, isn't it? It's not a car, Mr. Howard. It's a Mercedes, and that's the difference. No, I know it's a Mercedes, but it's just still a lot of money. Well, maybe you shouldn't buy the car then. Get a Nova. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Get a Nova. Now, there's no extras, right? That's it. That's everything. I don't imagine at that price I'd have to add. No, just leather. That's all you'd have to add. Nothing else. Really? Yeah. It doesn't come with leather. No, sir, it does not. That's why I told you you'd have to add it. Well, what's in there? Well, it's what they call Mercedes leather. What would that be? Well, it's a very thick vinyl. Beautiful seat. I would prefer that. So let's call it that then. Fine. Beautiful thick vinyl seat. But I have it. Gee, isn't that something? Wouldn't you think there'd be leather in there? I tell you what, if you buy the car, I'll put some shoes in it, okay? Okay. All right. So. Well. Uh-huh. All right, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I will see you when? Tomorrow night? Well, I don't know. I'm going to think about it. Talk about it with my wife. It's a pretty big decision. Let's set a day now. How about Friday morning? I, I don't think I can commit to any day right now. Certainly well, not this lose week. The car, you know. I have uh, stars coming in and looking at the car. Let me just call you back, all, <laughs> all right? right. Hold on a second. All right. You hear it now, right? Yeah, I do. <laughs> I do just got stars coming in. Makes me laugh. All right. The uh, brilliance of Albert Brooks. All right. Paul Wagner is uh, going to come on right after the break. Adam Carollas, I'm your emotional support animal, navigating our all-woke, no-joke culture, has over a thousand five-star reviews on Amazon. Here's one. Completely on point and completely relevant for today, Jack and War showing us that something saying, physics see Uncle Ben and Uncle Janima. Eloquent and succinct. Pick up I'm Your Emotional Support Animal, navigating our all-woke, no-joke culture, and leave your five-star review on Amazon. Get all the links at adamcarolla.com. Paul Wagner's joined us, freelance journalist, writer, podcast producer, and a former news reporter with four Emmys, uh, by the way, and many, many other prestigious awards. The podcast, American Nightmare Season 2, Murder in a Safe Place. New episodes every Monday on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Podcast One. Good to see you, Paul. Hey, Adam. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. So uh, let's talk about this uh, particular case that we're covering in season two here. That's um, Well, you give us the nuts and the bolts of it. So the background is this, is back in January 13th, 1998, a woman named Sherry Crandall, a nurse and administrator, was working inside a large hospital just outside Washington, D.C., when she was attacked uh, by a man who uh, tied her up, raped her, and strangled her to death. And um, this was uh, late in the evening. She was working late. Um And uh, it was a complete and total shock to everyone in the hospital that someone working inside an office in this sprawling 40-acre campus uh, could just be attacked and that this person could just slip into the hospital and then slip out because no one was caught that night. However, what happened is police did get uh, some DNA 
Uh, they have some fingerprints. And we learned very recently that they had a very good witness as well. But here we are 23 years later, and they have still not caught this person. And the same detective who showed up at that hospital that night, a Prince George's County Police detective named Bernie Nelson, uh, he began the investigation that night, and he is still on the case today. So I decided to, to explore this story in a podcast, and I approached the family about a year ago, and they were very much uh, on board with it, uh, the three children of Sherry Crandall. They wanted to to see if a, perhaps a podcast with the huge reach of podcasts could possibly uh, change things, that they may be able to um, get some new information, get uh, new tips perhaps from people who may hear the details of this story in some of these podcasts that we're releasing and come forward. So uh, that's the basics of the story that uh, we're telling at this point. So she was like working a overnight shift or a night shift? She was an administrator and she was just working late. She was in what's called the family health center. It was basically a doctor's office inside the Prince George's Hospital Center. And um, she had some new duties and she was sending out some emails and so she was staying late. And we know now, um, because I've learned a lot more about this case, once the police agreed to cooperate fully in, in my investigation, We've learned that uh, two members of the cleaning crew actually saw her alive working alone inside her office between 7.15 and 7.30 that night. Then very recently, we learned that the police had a witness immediately thereafter that they never disclosed. They never told the public about it. And uh, we're revealing it in this podcast. She was a, a woman who had an intellectual disability. She was a housekeeper. And she said that she heard the woman screaming and that she walked in on the attack, and she saw this man, and she said he had on a white lab coat with a stethoscope in his pocket. But she wasn't sure what she was seeing. She thought, perhaps, that this guy was helping her, and she only realized later that he was hurting her, as she says. We've uh, obtained a videotaped interview with this woman. She's now deceased. Um, it's uh, now featured in episode two, which is out now. Um, so it's really surprising to hear what this woman has to say all these years later and then hear the police's explanation as to why they never told the public about this. Um, so we now know that she saw somebody that may have had a connection to the hospital. Now, what's happened since is, or I should say right after um, uh, that woman came forward with that information, the police said, well, we're going to have to check everybody who was in the hospital that night. And they began a, what's called a DNA dragnet. You know, you've heard of these things. They've done them in England and they've done them in other places. And they went after hundreds of men at the hospital. It was highly controversial and made national news. But they never got a match. They never found the person, even though they asked all these men for their, for their DNA. And so here we are all, all these years later, and they have this evidence. Um, and this is the, the best part of the story, is that when I started investigating this podcast, I never knew that the police were about to begin an investigation using genealogy. And that's the exciting part of this. And that uh, I'm sure you guys are, are familiar with the Golden State Killer. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, that's how they <clears throat> caught him. They used genealogy. They went after his relatives. They went into those ancestry databases. And so the Prince George's County Police are now doing the same thing. And they went into ancestry databases, and we now know they have uh, they've connected as close as a third cousin to the killer, and they're working backwards, and uh, and that's where they are right now. And so, it's pretty exciting to to be in the middle of this, to be telling this story at the time we know that a cold case is now getting a little warmer. What is what percent? So the the ancestry database is the genealogy family members submit to that voluntarily. I mean, they do it on their own volition to try to find out their heritage and this, that, and the other. And um, then they can start accessing that database. Um, what percentage of this country has a database and has submitted to those types of those tests? Do we know? 
Well, there's millions of people that have put their their own DNA into these databases. They're uh, the 23andMe, Ancestry.com, GEDmatch, Family Tree USA. Um, but what I've learned is that um, some of those databases are not allowing law enforcement to get into them. But there are uh, databases that are. And, uh, and so there's some private labs here in the Washington area. Both of them are in Virginia. One's called Parabon Nano Labs. The other one's called Bodhi Technology Group. And they have forensic genealogy units now that are doing nothing but trying to help police close cold cases, um, cold cases and, and cold rape cases. And so they're allowing these these companies are allowing um, the, the police to get into those databases and Here's another little part to this that's really interesting, is that these labs can put the DNA in, get some family trees that they can hand over to the police to start working on. And then, according to the laws, and depending on the laws for each jurisdiction, they can then put the DNA back in, let's say, a month later. And, but they can't keep it in there. So they, they can just put it in for a, a, a period of time, determine whether or not any new family trees, or I should say any new DNA has come in. So, f for example, they may have a family tree that they're working on with a third cousin. And then a month later or two months later, they put the killer's DNA back in and bang, all of a sudden they're close as a second cousin or maybe a brother. And it's happened. And and there's four cases right here outside D.C. in Montgomery County, Maryland, that they've, they've closed some extremely difficult uh, cases with this genealogy work. This woman had three children. Yeah, she has three children. Um, uh, has Tiffany, three children. Darren and Luke. And, yeah. How, how old were they when she was killed? Uh, Luke was uh, just sixteen. Darren was twenty, and Tiffany was twenty-two, I believe. Oh. Um, are, are these are these databases like? Is it a matter of you have to opt in if you're a user, an unsuspecting user? If I'm just you know just me wanting to you know find my ancestry on Twenty Three and Me or Ancestry or whatever, or is it like read the fine print because they have the right to do with your DNA what they whatever they want? It's How a very good. Work? It's a very good question. So. Um, some of these companies now have an automatic opt out. So I initially you had to tell them that you wanted your DNA tested and a result made, and then you wanted their DNA, your, you wanted your DNA taken back out of their database. Um, now it's changed. These companies are saying it's an automatic app opt out. So if you want to keep your DNA in, you have to put a check mark on there and say, keep my DNA in your database. Mm -hmm. So in effect, that is a kind of a setback for law enforcement. Sure. Gina. Um, so you mentioned the Golden State Killer. That's exactly who I was thinking of. And when I thought about that. I thought that it's it's kind of given birth to the internet sleuth, the home sleuth, mm. um, some legitimacy to a lot of people who are just kind of at home and, and willing to do the legwork online. Is that something that you're sort of interested in, or that you you follow it all as well? Th that happens. Um, uh, there's a there was a case. There's a very uh, good podcast out there called Bear Brook that I've listened to, mm -hmm. and there was a. You're familiar with it. Yeah. So it, it was a private citizen, a woman who came forward to volunteer and and she knew how to work the the genealogy. She knew right. how to uh, you know go to libraries and 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 look through court records and she knew how to uh, look at birth records and census records and and obituaries and she helped out. She was a private citizen that that has helped out. And so there are people who are coming forward that have this expertise that are offering their expertise. In um, in this case, uh, this is uh, in, in the story that we're telling, there is a, a woman who has this expertise who's who works for the county and she is um, she's helping the police with her expertise in this. So but you're right there. You, you can be a, a, a private citizen, a sleuth and sit down and, and do your own research. Well, you think about Michelle McNamara, who, you know, wrote I'll Be Gone in the Dark, you know, about the Golden State Killer, Pat Oswalt's former wife. And you think this is a real thing. This is a legitimate thing that people do. Oh, it's. The genealogy right now is is just so fascinating that, you know, the, the, the FBI has this, uh, you know, database called CODIS. It's the National DNA Data Bank where they have millions of profiles of criminals. But if you put the killer's DNA into that database and you never get a hit for years and years and years, you're like, well, what's my recourse here? Right. 
And so the police are going, well, let's tap these private databases and, and let's, let's see what we can get. And it's really been stunning the number of cases that have been closed this way. There shouldn't be any male homicide detectives anymore. This is a female job. I don't <laughs> yeah. know. First off, they're obsessed with this shit. You have to, let's face it, guys go home, they crack a beer, they watch the ball game. Women go home, hop on the computer, take a deep dive, obsess over it, talk amongst each other. You know, these detective guys, like, uh, they they like solving crime, but they don't love solving crime like women do. They don't do it in their spare time. Uh, So I I guarantee this guy was a, yeah, the guy was probably a big um, Redskins fan or Washington football team. He spent every Sunday with a beer on his belly watching the game and stuff. Women, they, they they don't go off the clock when it comes to sleuthing, th- this kind of thing. They just go home right. and obsess on it. And you would you would literally, now we're at the point where you've kind of unleashed this army of women who n- never leave the computer. Yeah, the guy's watching porn on the computer on a Saturday night. Women, no way. They got a g- cup of Sanka between their legs. They're, uh, they're taking deep dives. Because it, it's really, if you think about it, whatever your profession is, it's kind of the person with the obsession, you know, the passion. It's not a job. It's like it's like a way of life. It's like it's a part the pun in their DNA. So uh, I do think there's going to be a lot more women solving a lot more of these uh, <laughs> unsolved crimes. As they're very oftentimes the women are oftentimes victims. And I think there's some connection, you know, like r- raped and killed at work, you know, as a woman, like working late in a uh, hospital where you think you'd be safe. Yes. By the way, any kids listening, this is why you should never work late. Just say no. I don't care how much it pisses off the boss. <laughs> well, so DNA data banks, where are we all sort of philosophically on having a DNA database for everyone who's just born. Like you're born, you give up a little DNA, you're in a you're in a base. There's there the freak out sort of Tom Cruise movie or well in right. kind of future yeah. vibe or do we go I got nothing to hide. This is going to get a lot of cases off the books that much faster certainly in the future. What do you uh, what do you guys think? I personally, in terms of like a slippery slope, I'm not worried about somebody having my DNA and accusing yeah. me of a crime. I'd be more worried about eugenics and things like, oh, there, there's some shit in that DNA. Let's try and, uh, you know, let's try and get rid of yeah. it. Let's try and weed mm. them out. Starting Otherwise, off as one thing and ending up as another is, is the more risky scenario. I like, I like it like it is now because criminals generally not uh, that smart. And if you're submitting yourself uh, to these um, systems and, and databases and like, yeah, take my DNA, do whatever you want with it. Maybe you fit the profile. <laughs> well, where are, would the smart money be that this guy was in prison somewhere? It, it, it oftentimes happens that way for obviously a different well, crime. Well, here's, here's why I don't think he's in prison is because um, prisoners have to give up their DNA. Oh, and, they do. Uh, if, if he gave up his DNA, they'd have him already because right. uh, the DNA was sitting in the National DNA Data Bank. They also have his fingerprint. And, and, and those are in national uh, FBI databases and local databases. And so that's the most intriguing and, and mysterious part of this whole story is that um, this, they have this evidence. And uh, as one detective that I talked to told me, he's just shocked they, they haven't closed this case. Now, when you talk to detectives about stories like this, they'll tell you, well, either the person is dead, he never committed another crime, um, uh, or, or there's some other scenario. Uh, there is a case here in Maryland in which uh, a, a man went and killed a, a man that owned a grocery store in, uh, in Montgomery County, Maryland. Um, and then he went on the straight and narrow. He married a D.C. police officer, and he never committed Hiding another in crime. He, right. he never committed another crime. And so they had DNA all those years and they couldn't connect him to the case and then they started using genealogy and they found him and they found him last february he had married this uh dc police officer they she was retired and they moved to virginia beach and he was working as a garage tech down there and the police showed up and they said you know we have a warrant for your your dna give it up he gave it up it was an exact match so it's possible. There's a possibility that this person that killed Sherry Crandall 
all of a sudden, you know, had some kind of remorse and decided I'm not going to commit any more crimes where my fingerprints or DNA might be taken. It's it's possible. Do do you think this was utterly random? It seems so unlikely that somebody just was stumbling down the hall kind of thing and saw the light on in her office. I mean, I'm sure everyone has checked out past relationships or ex-husbands mm-hmm. or all that stuff, mm-hmm. but you've checked out everyone she, who worked there. It just seems so, it seems random to be redundant to say that it was just random, like it just, just well, happened in there, real time. There were, uh, uh, as we tell the story, there were a number of problems with security at the hospital. The security was uh, was lax. The security director was fired two weeks later. And uh, in the podcast, we tell the story that um, someone came in to um, the hospitals into that office's waiting room and stole a TV off the wall about two weeks before Sherry was killed. And it took about 30 minutes for the security to show up uh, when they were called. And that infuriated Sherry. And so she fired off an email to her bosses and said, this was too close. And she said, I'm afraid that what could happen in the future here is, is a personal assault. So in a way, she almost predicted her own demise. And um, and so there were problems, and the police have you know, looked very closely at that, at um, that that's a possibility, that this was a thief who came in to the hospital because we now know it was easy to get in, it was easy to get out, and uh, um, that that possibly is what happened here. But then the question is, if this was a thief and this was somebody who was committing crimes, well, where's where's his trail? You know, he's a ghost. Well, I want to say this. I'm not into cancel culture and everyone getting fired from their job, but for weird tweets you sent out in high school. But if you're the head of security at a hospital yeah. and That's somebody true. is raped and murdered on, on your watch, I, yeah. I think I, I won't complain that much if you, uh, if you get your walking papers. Is, are these things, <clears throat> you know, we hear about murders and violent crime and a lot of it is just people running around in the street shooting each other now. But are these kinds of crimes because of the advent of uh, the genealogy stuff and security cameras and ring doorbell cameras? I, I feel like there's a, just a camera everywhere now. Are these waning these kinds of crimes? Are there less of them than there would have been in the 70s? Or I know this wasn't the 70s, but I just mean I'm, I'm guessing the hospital wasn't outfitted with tons of security cameras. Uh, well, what we learned is that they had dummy cameras. <laughs> they oh, had camera- boy. Right. Yeah, they, that they, helped. They had cameras that looked like cameras and weren't cameras. Um, they had a, a camera on the fourth floor where Sherry worked. And when they went to go look at it, they checked the VHS tape and there was no tape in there. <laughs> uh, so uh, they could have had possibly some video from up there. But in my years reporting crime in the city, I, I've seen it change just absent uh, exponentially in in the security cameras that are just everywhere these days and it always never ceases to amaze me that these people are willing to commit crimes in front of cameras it, it happens every day and uh, the dc police are constantly putting out video and still pictures of people who are caught you know uh, committing a crime and then somebody dimes them out for ten thousand dollars or whatever they are you know police are offering Um, So there's a lot of other changes, too, in that uh, cell phones. I mean, the cell phones for police are an amazing resource. Uh, They track people. They retain all sorts of information, text messages, photographs, the GPS. Um, So, yeah, the fact is that this since Sherry was murdered back in 1998, even though the police have that DNA and the fingerprints, they're working with less then, of course, than what they would have had today. Wow. It, it's, I mean, the only thing, I guess, worse than this happening to your mom or family member, or sister, or whoever, is just having it unsolved for all, yeah. Yeah. all of these years. And I think, and I don't know if this is good or bad, but in, the, in a different era, once you got 10 years past the, the crime, I think the family would turn the page. I mean, it, you're always devastated by it, but you're not, you don't have hope anymore of this thing being cracked. But there's been so many cases recently of cases that were cracked 25, 30, 35 years 
on that as a surviving family member, you have to kind of get up every day, even if you're 23 years down the road and kind of go, maybe there's a test yeah. and a DNA thing today. Yes, uh, Brian. Not just that, but the advent of uh, of the True Crime podcasts, which are huge, obviously. Like Now you can go to this third party and be like, hey, I've got a story. My father was killed in 1992 or whatever it was. It's like, oh, well, let's then that, 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 that's a real avenue now. Well, the, the children were on board uh, virtually uh, immediately when I approached the oldest child. Um, she thought, well, let me talk to my two brothers. One is a police officer. Um, he was a, he was initially a little concerned about it, but he was eventually on board. Um, and when I interviewed him, he said to me, I said to him, what would it mean to you if Detective Nelson um, closed this case? And he said, um, he surprised me. He says, think of the the best thing or the best moment you've ever had in your life and multiply that by 10. <laughs> That's yeah. how badly he wants this solved. He, these kids uh, were traumatized by this uh, at a time in their lives where they really relied on their mom. And so uh, they, they would love to see it closed. Well, I, you know, I'm, I'm a big kind of private enterprise guy and i you know we were talking yesterday about elon musk and you know he'll get us to mars faster and cheaper but i i like the deputization of the citizens i like that there's all these people with computers and time and they're innovative and you know they're interested they're interested and there's no they're they're never off the clock because they're never on the clock you know what i mean they (laughs) They're, you never have to punch out, yeah. you know, they're just, they're just there. And it, it makes me hopeful that something, you know, it's probably, it might not come from inside the precinct, you know, but that some version of uh, Pat Oswald's uh, deceased wife, I cannot recall her name, Michelle. Gina, Michelle, like there's gonna, there's just gonna be more and more of these people. And, and I, it's a kind of, weird privatization of law enforcement in its own own weird way or it's uh, i don't know what we always talk about maybe it is a truly a community policing you know that we're always talking about but i uh i love it and then and that things like you know podcast and uh genealogy and all this stuff, n- none of this existed in 1999 i think it was 98 98 98 when she was yeah. uh, deceased uh, Paul, I will tell people to uh, check out the pod, American Nightmare Season 2, Murder in a Safe Place. And, uh, yeah, usually when they say in a safe place, they're talking about a quiet neighborhood. But in the middle of a you hospital, know, hospital building, right. for right. Christ's sake. Yeah. Yeah. New episodes uh, every Monday on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Podcast One. Paul Wagner, thank you uh, so much for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me, and thanks for letting me tell the story. I appreciate it. Keep telling those stories. All right, we will uh, do a quick spot here, and then we'll talk to uh, Ira Rosen, writer, producer. Been with um, 60 Minutes for, I don't know, since 40 years? Yeah, over 40 years, and uh, he he just retired (laughs) last year. So it's going to give us all the... All the skinny about what went on behind the scenes. One of my favorite all-time shows, 60 Minutes. First, I'll tell you about Geico. Do you own, do you rent your home? Well, I bet you do one or the other. How about you uh, get your automotive policy and you bundle that bad boy at Geico. Geico makes it easy. You got so much to do already. You want to save time. So you go to geico.com. You get a quote. See just how much you could save when you get your bundle on because, uh, could do that with Geico. It's Geico easy. Visit geico.com today and get your bundle rolling. All right. We'll talk about uh, one of my favorite TV shows from a guy who's uh, been there from, well, not quite the beginning, but uh, a damn long time. Uh, Close enough. And we'll talk to Ira Rosen right after this. It's time to check Adam's voicemail. Hey, Ace, funny thing about uh, Andrew Cuomo, huh? He went from Emmy Award winner to getting (laughs) M-E-2'd. You can leave us a message at 888-634-1744. Well, speaking of Emmy Award winning, our next guest, Ira Rosen, has uh, won 24 Emmy Awards in 40 years. Is that correct? (laughs) 
Yeah, I only built shelves for 20 of them, so it was a problem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, wow. Uh, new book, uh, Ticking Clock Behind the Scenes at 60 Minutes, available now on Amazon. Well, this has always been one of my favorite shows, so I'm interested in all that's going on behind the scenes there. So welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Um, so you show up in uh, 1980 as a segment producer? No, I showed up. I showed up as a as a little pitcher in 1980 with barely enough journalism experience to to uh, to get a job as a copy boy in Long Beach, California. And uh, what happened was Don Hewitt had seen a story I'd done locally and liked it. And Don was Don was the creator of 60 Minutes, and he operated out of a sense of touch. He didn't need a resume to say if he liked you or didn't like you. And when I sat down with Don, I told him that I learned the art of storytelling from uh, working the lights in the Catskill hotels, the comedians, Henny Youngman, Jan Murray, Red Buttons. And what their genius was, they told a joke, like, take my wife, please. Four words, beginning, middle and end, has motivation, or I'm going to take my wife to a place she's never been before, the kitchen. kitchen. Right. So, yeah. So, you know, it's it has that sort of rhythm to it. And that's the way I always thought TV stories should be told. I said this to Don and he says, me too. That's where I learned storytelling. And so he walks me down the hallway into Mike Wallace's office and he says, it doesn't matter if I like you. He has to. Mm -hmm. And Don tried to make me at first comfortable. Mike wanted me to be uncomfortable. So he sits me down and he says an amazing question. He says, I know what I could do for you. What could you do for me? And I really didn't have a good answer because there, you know, I couldn't think of one. And then I noticed there was a tennis ball in the corner of his office. I said, you play tennis. And he said, what's it to you? And so I said, well, I was on the Cornell tennis team. And he said later, he figured he'd get six months of tennis out of me before firing me. So <laughs> that's how I got my start with the guy in 1980. Did Wallace, was it, am I remembering right that Wallace's son is the one who had that tragic accident in Greece, like he fell down a mountainside? No, you're right. Yeah, no, he had he had two boys, Peter and Chris. Chris, you obviously know. And Peter was the one who was hiking in uh, Greece and uh, fell off the side of a mountain. And Mike didn't hear from him for a few weeks, so he went back to Greece. And he was the one who ended up discovering the body. Uh, you know, his, Peter was on the way to a monastery to visit an old monastery. And can you imagine looking down the side of a mountain and seeing your son's body at the bottom? And it changed his life forever because he decided at that point that he's going to take up what Peter wanted to do, which was being a journalist. At the time, Mike was doing fluffo commercials and cigarette commercials, and he had kind of a lame show on TV. But he decided to turn his life around and he went into CBS News and he took a big pay cut. And and, uh, you know, the rest is it. By the way, during that period of time, he got friendly with Richard Nixon and Nixon had offered him the job of press secretary, which Ron Ziegler later took. And so Mike had a choice. Go to be Richard Nixon's press secretary or start the show that uh, this crazy guy, Don, you would wanted to start, which was 60 Minutes. Pretty good choice. How many years has 60 Minutes been running now? Fifty three. Jesus Christ. Not bad. Right? That's crazy. Yeah. Second only to South Park uh, <laughs> in terms of longevity, people. Wow. And also, um, there's been a lot of, uh, they've, they've done a lot of satellites. I don't mean satellite stuff, but I just mean uh, there's 60 minutes Australia, right? There's 60 minutes in Europe, I guess they've, they've franchised, right? They franchise the name, but they can't franchise the magic. The magic is the art of storytelling, which you do and which, you know, anybody who's kind of does this stuff for a living does well. And what Don Hewitt's, the secret sauce of 60 Minutes is tell me a story. And that's and Don actually wrote a book called Tell Me a Story. And and that's what we, was ingrained to us at the very beginning um, when when I would be doing this book. You know, some people take notes. I would be writing stories, you know, from from what I did, you know, for I, I mean, I, I met Marlon Brando and, you know, Marlon Brando was in his time the world's greatest actor. And 
he and I got to know each other a little bit. And he, I'd call him up on a, on in April when it was his birthday. And I'd say, hey, Marlon, happy birthday. He said, what is it with you guys? Birds don't celebrate birthday, birthdays. Trees don't celebrate birthdays. Animals don't celebrate birthdays. Marlon, I'm just calling you up to wish you a happy birthday. I don't care. And then he would call me up. And by the way, the, that that he never said hello how are you it would he would just start talking and it would last 10 minutes and then he would just abruptly hang up so one day he calls me up and he says you ever know these people who have these great reputations who are really assholes and i said marlon i gotta meet somebody at a local bar and and he said he ignores the comment he said charlie chaplin great reputation total asshole william saroyan great reputation and a total asshole and I said, Marlon, listen, can we talk about this later? And then he starts reading me Saroyan and in that Brando voice. And needless to say, I stuck around for the duration of that. It was pretty cool. <laughs> Ultimately, we, we, he, me, Mike Wallace, myself and him had dinner in, uh, you know, in off of Mulholland Drive. And um, Mike can't resist himself and Marlon can't resist. So he says to Mike, you know, Mike, I've admired you for a long time for your acting ability. And he says, what are you talking about? I'm a journalist. No, no, you're a great actor. The raised eyebrow, the look of astonishment. You know, you're a genius. So Mike decides to give it back to him. How did you get so fat? And he says, well, I go to Baskin and Robbins. I can't decide what flavor ice cream I want. So I end up ordering every one, every flavor they have. And I bring it home and I eat it all. At which point, you know, he says, Mike, I'm 67 years old. I don't need to establish my reputation by showing America what an a-hole you are. Let's just be friends. And I, of course, go crazy. So Brando had one final conversation with me after that. He didn't want to have much to do with me after that dinner. So he pulls me up and he said, you play the stock market. I said, a little bit. I don't have much money. He said, well, let me give you a tip. I said, what's that? A company called Apple. I said, I never heard of it. He said, you will. I'm telling you, trust me, put all your money into it. So I go to Wallace and I say, hey, Mike, you know, I just had this conversation. Brando, he tells me about this company called Apple. He said, you're going to buy the stock? I said, are you crazy? Why would I take a stock tip from a guy who can't decide what flavor ice cream he wants? <laughs> wow. <laughs> what year What year was the Apple conversation? It was like 84. Uh, yeah. And Steve Jobs wanted Brando to do commercials at that time. So he approached him. And, you know, you know, he um, so he found out a little bit about the company. The company had obviously gone public, was being traded. But, you know, people didn't you know, it was, I'm sure some people focused on it, but not a lot. I was just literally in my shop um, an hour and a half ago looking at the Apple. So I have the first race car that Apple sponsored back in 1980. So they were, wow. they were doing well enough in 1980 that they could sponsor a Porsche 935 for a season, which is an expensive car, to go to Le Mans, go to Paris or France, race at Le Mans, race at all these, these big wow. races. But it is weird when you're looking at the car and you're just looking at the pictures and the old pictures of the car. And... And I, it's funny because I do always think of Apple's kind of a new new company, but we're 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 now kind of knocking on the door fifty years, right? I mean, if they were sponsoring a nine thirty five in 1980, 1981, that wasn't two guys in a garage at that point. I mean, they were selling some units. Uh, it, it's kind of crazy to think that we are coming up on. I mean, I don't know, we're forty five years, forty six years. I'd have to. Somebody could figure it out, but uh, yeah, that's what I was doing two hours ago, staring at an <laughs> Apple livery on a car. <laughs> I don't own any stock either, but I should have. I bought the car. Um, who did you? I'm looking down these lists uh, list of hosts through through the through the years, and uh, I have my favorites. You know, Ed Bradley left the us uh, too early. Was he the best? Uh, uh, everybody loved the guy. Everybody wanted to work with him. He had just this magic about him. He would he would uh, take his suits and he would just change his entire wardrobe and throw it away every three years. Uh, and yeah. 
Before we move from Ed Bradley, I'm sorry, you may know where this is going. Can you please, as somebody with some insight, tell us about the earring? The world stopped turning when we saw the earring. Yeah, yeah. Ed was, um, you know, Ed loved his jazz and loved his music. And um, he would go, he would become a, a major fixture at uh, Jazz Fest in New Orleans. And one day he just decided to put an earring on, you know, the fellow musicians got him into it and he just wore it. And, you know, it fit perfectly with him. It was a great, it was great. Yeah. Um, yeah. He think- used to go down there and play, there was, there's a song, uh, 60 Minutes Man. And uh, he'd go, he'd take the stage of whatever band was playing it and he'd play tambourine. Uh, he was just cool. <laughs> And I think he paved the way for the old guy earring. I, I got to believe without yeah. Ed Bradley, there would be no Harrison Ford earring. Right. You know what I mean? I, I, I think you're right. I think you're exactly right. Yeah. Once again, the white man ripping off the black That's man's right. culture. Every time. You know what I mean? <laughs> so I liked, uh, I'm going to go for a, a deeper cut. I always liked Scott Pelle. Am I saying this same way? Scott Pelle. Scott Pelle, yeah. Pelle, yeah. Scott Pelle. I, I don't know why. I I uh, I like that guy. I like the. Uh, I mean, Harry Reasoner was awesome. Mike Wallace, awesome. of course, morally safer. Um, I mean, wh- I don't know. Will we ever? Huh, can we ever? I first off, what kind of numbers was sixty minutes doing at at the height of its powers? Because you know. It was always appointment viewing Sunday night. You know, you could hear the iconic opening, the the stopwatch ticking. Yeah, like was that was that a top five show, top three show? It was the number one show in the country, um, probably hitting thirty million viewers easy. Uh, you know, I wrote in my book that it had an audience that rivaled the Super Bowl today right. um, at its height. Uh, and that's what was so amazing when they they kind of gave me a job. They were the number one show in the country and they, they assigned me to the number one correspondent in the country. And you were mentioning those people. I mean, Scott is a master at putting together a story. He's he's a real he he learned from Don that sense uh, of storytelling. Uh, Harry Reisner was another one who was a genius. He did this story, uh, you may remember it. He, what he, they were selling off the movie set Casablanca and they were, se- they were selling it off piece by piece. And he did a story about that. I mean, who would ever think of doing that? And he sat in a tuxedo and he said, you know, I, everyone remembers who they saw the movie Casablanca with. And if she's looking in right now, here's looking at you kid. And he took a took a belt and, you know, it was just magical. Um, You know, Morley Safer going down on the Orient Express, the last train ride in Europe and the the majesty of that. Uh, Harry did a story once, which I always loved about old people driving in Florida, Um, you know, where, where the problem is, you know, so on one hand they can't drive, but on the other hand, if you take away their license, they're, they're dead. They're dead. They're just going to sit at their home and die. So so the judges end up letting them keep their licenses, even though some of them are half blind. And it was just it was a story that 40 or 50, whatever number of years later, it still it still is is res- it has resonance to it. I, um, people still remember that story. I could remember. I have these weird little flashbacks. I uh, the 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 piece is like when they interviewed Muhammad Ali. Oh yeah. And uh he I think he would pretend to fall asleep and then pop right. up and scare the crap out of I I don't know who was uh I'm trying to think of who interviewed well he's probably been on multiple times. They're weird little No no but that that was that's was a fantastic story. The producer on that, John Hamlin, um actually had known about that uh little scene beforehand and was able to sort of, um, you know, have it play out to play a little bit of a gag on Ed. Um, so, yeah, I know these are incredible stories that that were done. They, they stay in your yeah. memory. Do you, do you guys, do, you, yes. you guys know that story? 60 Minutes was never not on there, in our house. There was yeah. one, and there's one, and I won't, I won't help you at all because I just have this little glimpse, but I was probably watching when I was 
19. And it struck me as bizarre. They were interviewing some Idi Amin type, some guy who was the tyrannical ruler of some banana republic or something. And he was, they were asking him, a, they're interviewing him at a big like gathering, an outdoor gathering, a, a, a festival, a, a, a celebration of, and, and whoever was interviewing him said to him, and he was like, you know, out of central casting with the big general outfit on and everything. And uh, they said to him, in your country, uh, there's so much um, oppression of women and, and rape. And the guy, guy goes, look around. Do you see anyone being raped? And I just remember thinking, he was at a cocktail party, like in, in the palace, you know. And I just remember thinking, what an insane statement. Like, how can you say there's rape in my country? Look, look, we have an open bar. We, we have a cheese platter over here. You don't, you don't see anyone being raped, do you? Hardly any. Well, the great one was, of course, when Mike Wallace interviewed the Ayatollah Khomeini, where he sat there and he said, you know, this is the hostages are taken and this is the first big interview with the Ayatollah. And Mike says to him, you know, Anwar Sadat, who was head of Egypt at the time, Anwar Sadat called you a lunatic. Not me. Forgive me. Not me. Not me. Him. Right. And you could see, you know, and uh, the Ayatollah is not even looking at Mike. It's like, you know, the sky f- fly on my suit. And then suddenly he looks up at the guy and says, basically, you know, Sadat is going to get his. <laughs> and he got <laughs> and it, know, right? He was he, Exactly. We all know what happened later on. He was um, assassinated. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there must have been, I mean, it's still going on, but there had to be a a kind of a high fear level going into some of those places. Well, I did a story, yeah. I, did a, you know, I have it in my book, where I did the story in Pakistan. And what happens is you, you feel the danger more sitting in New York City or in the U.S. When you're in Pakistan, you don't feel the danger. And this is like right after uh, 9-11. And uh, like an idiot, I decide to go to the local Red Mosque where this guy Razi was. His English was better than mine. And I figured, oh, you know, he speaks pretty good English. How bad can this guy be? He was the Al Qaeda guy inside uh, Islamabad. So I go in and I do the interview with him, and it's a pretty good interview. And you know, he he he's he's completely insane, but you know, whatever. Nobody's perfect. So the we go into the back of the madrasa, and my CBS fixer is there, and suddenly the two of them are yelling at each other in Urdu, and like I'm shaking my head, you know, I'm smiling, yeah, you know, this is cool. And my CBS guy takes me by the shirt and grabs me and hauls me out into the into or outside, and gets me into the car and he starts heaving. And I said, what just happened? And he said, well, they were talking about making you another Daniel Pearl. Daniel Pearl was the journalist who was yep. beheaded. Right. And uh, they're talking about making you another Daniel Pearl. And I told them that if they kidnap you, my brother is the police chief in Kohat, a nearby town, and he's going to track every one of your the members of your family down by a morning and slaughter them. And uh, <laughs> this is how they, they talk in Pakistan. Mm. And, so, and um, that bought me a minute, you know, like, I don't know, should we allow our parents, you know, to get slaughtered or do you want to accept <laughs> right. it in New York? So they we got away. Um, but I had no idea what was going on. Um, in the book, uh, you say uh, Katie Couric is lazy, Diane Sawyer is two-faced, and Chris Cuomo's entitled. Maybe we should talk <laughs> a little about that. Uh, Chris Cuomo's sort of in the news now, certainly with his with his brother. Uh, what do you mean by entitled? Well, actually, I didn't say that was a uh, tabloid headline. Ah. Uh, that was taken out of context. That no, actually, I re- I worked with Chris, and I actually kind of liked him. Um, he was he was very upfront, very direct. And I, as I wrote in my book, you know, I, I uh, was wrong about the guy. He was able to turn his style and his personality around to sort of make something of himself on CNN. And he made that persona kind of work for him on TV. Um, what I actually, you know, when, when you when the book gets sort of taken away from you in a in a tabloid world, you sort of lose control of it. But actually, you know, Diane Sawyer and I did some amazing stories together. Um, she's she's an amazing TV correspondent, writer, storyteller. 
Um, and so, you know, I'm proud of the work we did there. Well, walk us through the process. So sure. I think, I think a lot of Americans are a little jaded and they think, you know, well, the reporter sits down and reads the teleprompter that someone else loaded up and, you know, travels around, does an interview and stuff, but uh, they probably don't know how involved they are in the, in the actual story. So like work it from the pitch. I mean, I guess I've been in writer's rooms a lot, not, not doing news, but you do comedy and you go, here's my pitch. Here's what I think would be a good idea. This would be funny. We should do this. And you know, you kind of spitball it and sometimes they work and oftentimes they don't. But at some point, if we go, okay, let's do it. Then you're the person that has to write that script and sort of bring that thing to fruition to, to life. So just sort of walk us through, you know, Monday morning or do they give you Monday they give you Monday off. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, yeah, no, no. What, what? It, no, it's not Monday off. But what you do is there's something called a blue sheet sy system, which is a quick claim deed on a story. Usually in the old days, it was whatever was in the New York Times that day, and and you try to get your blue sheet in, and then if you do, you own that story. Um, but a lot of times, it's just reading magazines, talking to sources. So one day, one of my favorite stories, I was reading a magazine about truffles. You know, you know what truffles are, black sure. truffles, white truffles, dogs dig them out in the ground in France. Or and pigs, it turned out right? That the pig, they used to use pigs, but the pigs ended up eating the truffle. Yeah. Dogs yeah. do it now. Oh. Dogs, yeah, dogs do it now. So um, what I discovered was that the Chinese had found the truffle, you know, and, and, a, and a handful of truffles could cost a thousand. Oh, bucks. yeah. I, I remember this story well. I know the <laughs> yeah. story very well. Yeah. Like, yeah. like bootleg and truffles, right? You got it. You got it. And so in China, they they found a knockoff. What, <laughs> what, it's what, not the what China I know. <laughs> no, they found a knockoff of the truffle that they, they were set, they were feeding to the pigs as sort of waste. And they said, the hell with the pigs. Let's feed them to the French. So they, they started exporting the, the, the Chinese truffles that taste basically like rubber, and they sent it to France. And then the restaurants in France started selling them to the American visitors, you know, black truffles. And so they said, well, they're black truffles and they're in France. So we're black truffles from France. And the dumb American visitors didn't know the difference. Oh, this tastes so good. It tastes like rubber. It had no smell. It was, you know. So I did, so I said, how about that story? And the guy was a little skeptical and I said, no, 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 it's a great story. And, you know, it, it has a little bit of a, it has food and an expose attached to it. So I said, okay, go for it. So I go over to France and I meet up with Olga Urban, Urbani who ran the largest truffle operation in the world. And uh, she ends up going truffle hunting with us wearing a full length mink, mink coat with Leslie Stahl and, and it was just the most fun story. And then in the end, we end up confronting one of these people who repackaged the Chinese truffles as French truffles. So it had a bit of an investigative story to it. And when we screened it, you know, the executive producer um, walks in and he sort of says, oh, so this is the mushroom story, huh? <laughs> and so we said, Leslie says, just watch the story and shut up. I said, okay. So we watched the story and jumps up. He said, now that's a 60 minute story. And that's like the highest compliment you could get. So it's the beginning, middle, and end of it is the, the producer certainly sometimes, most of the time finds the story, puts it together, researches it, writes it. And, you know, if, if you're in the hands of, you know, and my two favorite correspondents were Leslie Stoll and Bill Whitaker. Mm -hmm. And if you're in the hands of those two, they elevate it. Uh, Mike Wallace, when he did an interview, turned a B into an A. Um, that was the real genius of, of Mike. Um, he was a, he could look at a total stranger and know exactly what button to push to drive them crazy. Um, he he was he was a master at this sort of thing. What uh, so when would you what was tape day on sixty minutes? Well, what you do is you put together the stories in an edit room, right? And you and then you go through, you know, re revisions. Uh, and then what they do is on Friday afternoons, the correspondents tape the intros that you see every Sunday, mm -hmm. with the name of the producer behind it. 
uh, the best credit in TV. And, um, and then they put it together in the control room there, uh, marrying your story with what you see um, at the beginning of the, the uh, piece intro. Uh, and that's when they marry the ticking clock and all that stuff. So it's basically all packaged on Friday night unless they're crashing a story. And if they're crashing a story, it would be packaged sometimes, literally, uh, it could be live or it could be maybe an hour before air, before the seven o'clock hit time. Um, and, you know, that's happened to me. You know, I, I, I did a story, uh, even in the old time, I did a story once on uh, Jesse Jackson running for president, the very, very first time. We taped it that Sunday morning in Don Hewitt's office and I edited the piece together and then we married it, uh, you know, a half hour before broadcast. What year was the truffle story? Do you recall? Oh boy. Let me think. And maybe Chris can look it up, but it, they, you know, it's, I'm it's one of the largest, you could go on YouTube now. It, uh, it has like, you know, several million views. It's one of yeah. the most food pieces. What I think year? Was, I'm like, seeing 2012. 2012. 2012. Yeah. Okay. It was it's a, it is uh it is really the truffle story and uh, I'm not just saying it cuz you're here but uh it, it, that's really the genius of 60 minutes. Um I I'm from North Hollywood. I grew up eating uh macaroni and cheese from a box and you know spaghettios from a can. I don't think I'd even tasted a truffle sadly at at 2012 and I was fascinated, riveted but, you know, you're so used to news. I, I, I guess the real key is how do you take this thing that doesn't inherently sound interesting, it sounds like a mushroom story, and make it super fascinating, you know? And The way you do it is yes. I, I'm a little ADD, and that's helpful in TV. So if I get bored, I just move on. So what I, what I did in that truffle story, one of the elements that I was amazed by is that on, in Sunday church, people, you know, put money into the uh, contribution plate. Right. In France, they put truffles into the contribution right. plate. And I heard this. I said, are you serious? Yeah. You know, farmers, you know, they just throw a it's truffle. Valuable. Yeah. And so I got a film crew to go there and think of the expense just to get the farmer putting the truffle into the contribution plate. So, and um, because it was just a moment that you just will remember. It's also, uh, I feel like it's a, an easier pitch. If you say to Leslie Stahl, like you want to go to Beirut again, or <laughs> hold on, or I have a killer idea where we end up in France. How about <laughs> that? <laughs> Eating truffles. Yeah, no, you're exactly right. When I mentioned it to Leslie, she just said, I love it. When do we go? <laughs> yeah, she right. Ended bringing, she ended up bringing her husband. You know, <laughs> I knew it. It's 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 so. Listen, it's it's he kept wandering into the shot. It was like <laughs> the guys you know. figured this out is Adam Sandler. You know, like <laughs> hey, we're doing another movie in Maui. All right, when do you want us there? Uh, yeah, we, we last thing about the truffle story. Hmm. We ended up there's there was a guy in the south of France, Bruno. And Bruno is the largest restaurateur for truffles. They would fly in on helicopters just to eat lunch in Bruno's. And the number one dish was a boiled potato, little cream on it, little salt and pepper, and black truffle on top. It was to die for. You figured, what? Huh? It's all in the technique. Yeah, man. I can taste it. I can smell it. Yeah. I, I don't know. Is there any? All right. You know, it's good. Uh, even just a truffle oil or even those. Uh, I'll tell truffle you that. I'll, I'll tell you a tip. You know, truffle oil does not come from truffles. You know uh, that, just right? as long as it smells like it, that's fine. <laughs> I, uh, I on a, on a completely uh, poor guy side note, um, for those who are trying to stay keto and you get those um, cheese chips, those little round sort of crisp. cheese crisp mm -hmm. things. There's one that's a cheddar with truffle. Yes. Goddamn delectable. Yeah, uh, Ticking Clock, the name of the book, Behind the Scenes. It's 60 Minutes, available now on Amazon. Uh, Ira, this has been uh, delightful. Well, thank you so much for having this. This has been a lot of fun. I haven't talked about the truffle story. It makes me hungry. I think I'm going <laughs> to 
know, get some mac and cheese and <laughs> get some truffle. Uh, I Rosen, thank you so much for uh, joining us. Let me hit uh, relief ban and then we'll do some news. One third of Americans suffer from nausea. Ugh. That's got to be about the worst feeling on the planet when you wake up with that nausea. That's why I'm excited to tell you about our partner, Relief Band. Number one, FDA cleared anti-nausea wristband, clinically proven to relieve nausea and vomiting from motion sickness, morning sickness, chemotherapy, anxiety, hangovers, migraines, and uh, more stuff we've all had to deal with in life. 100% drug-free, non-drowsy, fast-acting, all-natural relief with zero side effects. Originally developed 20 years ago in hospitals. Now it's over-the-counter relief band. Stimulates a nerve, uh, and it, it goes on your wrist. It's like a, it's like a little, little smartwatch, and it goes on your wrist, and it stimulates a nerve that goes to your brain and controls nausea and blocks the signal to your stomach telling you you're sick. I've used this thing. It works. It sounds uh, too good to be true, but it's true. It is Relief Band, right, Dawson? Ensure nausea is never the reason to miss out on life's important moments. Right now, Relief Band has an exclusive offer just for Adam Carolla listeners. If you go to reliefband.com and use promo code ADAM, you'll receive 20% off plus free shipping and a no-questions-asked 30-day money-back guarantee. So head to R-E-L-I-E-F-B-A-N-D.com and use promo code ADAM for 20% off. All right, we'll take a quick break. We'll come back with the news right after this. Give me the news with Grad. News with Gino Grad. Breaking viral. Weird crime protest politics. Give me news with Gino Grad. Stuff they saw on TMZ. Joe Biden. Come on out. Beat news with Gina Gino Grad. The news with Gina Grad. We haven't heard anything about the Chris D'Elia story in a while, and Ooh. a headline just popped up saying that he is facing a new lawsuit that accuses him of violating federal child pornography and sexual exploitation laws, including soliciting more than 100 sexually explicit photos and videos from a woman identified as Jane Doe, who was 17 um, when apparently when this went down, um, she had reached out to Delia in September of 2014 via Instagram, never expecting a reply. Uh, Delia was on his under no influence tour at the time. They communicated on Snapchat, according to the lawsuit. Uh, Delia's career took a hit. Uh, last June, after multiple women accused him via social media of sending graphic messages, soliciting sex. In some cases, the women had gone to see him in person and described inappropriate behavior seeking sex. Five of Delia's accusers spoke to the LA Times. Some of the women were uh, underage at the time. And I have a statement from Jane Doe. Uh, this is what she um, said in a recent statement. She says, when I was in my final year of high school and still a child, I was groomed by a celebrity twice my age. Chris D'Elia abused his status and fame to lure me in, take advantage and manipulate me when I was at a vulnerable age. I want any other girls out there to know that they are not alone and it's time to get justice for the mental and physical toll he has put us through. You know, I always talk about like how insidious something like being addicted to gambling is, you know, because mm -hmm. everyone always talks about addiction to drugs, alcohol, right. pain meds, you know, that kind of stuff. Opioids, but yeah. yeah, you can you can make it. You can be an alcoholic and uh, have, put in some good years. Hell, that's right. Create, write some great plays and movies. You know what I mean? Yeah. Be celebrated. You can be celebrated. Like you can be on Vicodin and keep your day job for a while or whatever. But I always said, like, when you're addicted to gambling, it just fucks you up immediately. Like you just go right through the money and uh, look right. no further than lost in America. Uh, but I, I, I think about like when you have kids, you kind of go like, and, and you go like, here's what I would wish for them. Here's what I wouldn't wish for them. Think about a kind of libido, like a sexual libido. That's a little off. You know what I mean? Like you like, you, you like underage people or you like young girls or young boys or, or it's just this crazy appetite where it's like every time I go on the road, I got to hook up with, with somebody. I can't just, right. you know, beat off and go to bed with the, with the rest of us, you know, with your plastic cup and your red wine. That's right. Sometimes in a mug. Yeah. Depending. Well, plastic cups over the wine. <laughs> right. The point is, is you, you realize like how many, 
of how many prominent people will just be undone. Maybe not in the past, but from this day forth, and we're now on the clock. Just what a what a what a life career, all encompassing destroyer. Just being essentially going. I like young chicks. You know, I like I like lots of I like young and I like a variety. You know what I mean? Like I and I I can't get enough. Like just if you and and by the way, once you're once you're kind of burdened with that or saddled with that or whatever it is, that's just kind of your thing. Like like mm-hmm. you know, it's not not here to uh, defend pedophiles, but uh, give me twenty minutes. Um, <laughs> what I'm saying this is, I bet those guys wish they weren't into that shit, sure. but they are. And now it shall destroy them and destroy others and destroy their families and their communities. And it's their like, career. it's, it, it is, it is, you know, you should hope. And there's kind of a weird thing. Like you don't want your son to be a eunuch, you know, uh, a healthy libido, but at some point you would wish for them this sort of balance, you know, like, well, have a few girlfriends in college and then meet somebody you marry and stay married forever and uh, have intercourse with that person. But when it's such a fucking, it's such a career killer now, or just being into something weird, like army hammer, you know what I mean? Or Marilyn Manson, like army hammer. I still don't really know what he did other than was weird, which is kind of enough. Uh, A crystalia, I don't know. I'm, I don't know everything about the underage stuff. Some of the non-underage stuff just seemed weird. You know, just kind of creepy. Like, hey, I'm a good-looking guy. I'm a celebrity. Like, come up to my room. I'll answer the door naked. You know, like off-putting. But uh, <laughs> and again, those moves where it's like they were eating at a restaurant and he stood up to use the bathroom. And the next thing you know, he was rubbing his ball sack on the back of my neck. Like, does that ever work? It must. Why was it How time? could it ever work? <laughs> it must. We were, I didn't know he was interested. We were Until sitting then. in a synagogue and uh, he <laughs> said he had to use the bathroom. And I felt his uh, his penis rubbing the back of my neck. It's like. No, not his payus, his penis. Right. Like, how does that work? Yeah. Does it ever work? It must. It must. Why else would they try that? Yeah. It Why must else work. is that in the repertoire? Yeah. It's like, does a pitcher hit, like throw a screwball if it doesn't work? No, it works yeah. sometimes. Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes you get knocked out of the park. Sometimes you strike right. the guy out. It's a numbers game. Noted. The one, <laughs> the one that they always do, but I just don't think ever works. But Brian's right. We only hear about it when it doesn't work, you know, because then the governor sat down next to me and he picked up my hand and he Mm -hmm. put it on his crotch and he asked me uh, if I if 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 I like to scrambled eggs for breakfast and I ran out of the room crying. But you don't hear the stories where the governor picked up my hand, put it on his crotch and I blew him in the limo. That's between us. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't make it out. You're right. Brian's right. There may be very many success stories that we just never hear about. Yeah. Think about every sports cheating scandal, doping or or uh, uh, deflating the ball or whatever, like or anything involving the Patriots, you know, filming you know, the other team's sidelines. It must work. They might, might must go on all the time. Yeah. So Chris D'Elia, who I haven't really heard anything from, has he no, been no. performing? Is he... I don't think so. How, I, how I good? I mean, in a he, weird. His agent dropped him. Manager dropped him. In a weird way, you think about stuff like anyone who got caught up with Me Too during COVID has the timing's never good to get Me Too'd. But the COVID timing, if you live in Los Angeles, is pretty mm-hmm. good because um, these guys, and I know it from being there, were you know, fixtures at the comedy store, fixture at the laugh Factory, fixtures at the improv. You just see the every Saturday night, every Wednesday night, they, they were just there. Right. And so it'd be super weird because it would be super obvious that you weren't showing up for a reason, but now no one's showing up for any reason. So it's not, COVID it's, it's not nearly as uh, glaring, but uh, anyway, um, well, He's been funny as shit on this show when he does uh, Jean-Claude Van Damme, and uh, I hope none of this is true. But 
you got to you got to listen to everyone's story and uh, weigh the evidence and we'll see where this one goes down. I still still don't know what's happening with Army Hammer. <laughs> <laughs> we'll 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 stay on that. But he does have a quote um, that the L.A. Times picked up. And I think this was this is from YouTube. Um, uh, let's see. The date of this is uh, February. So he said sex. It controlled my life. It was my focus all the time. And I had a problem and I do have a problem. It's not like months down the line. Everything's better. I need to work on that. Well, it's so, kind of what I'm saying. Like, yeah. You know, somebody is going to have to make a movie. Uh, where the story is this kind of knock around comedian, maybe journeyman, journeyman type, you know, um, been on the road his whole career, you know, not a headliner per se, um, and had the reputation with getting with all the waitresses at the club and uh, taking home the groupies or the fans back to the hotel that night and cheap motels and all that kind of stuff. And just a, just a, a profile of a guy who was like a kind of journeyman. I'm not talking about a guy in his sixties, but just a guy had been at it since 1920 and is now 35 or something does a set you know, at the Laugh Factory on a Sunday night, somebody's in the audience sort of discovers him, wants him to make wants him to make him the new host of The Bachelor or whatever it is. And this guy does the math. Like, <laughs> I'm, if I get high profile for 10 seconds, there's going to be 2000 people I betted on the road for the last 20 years. Like, just it's going to it's going to be a shit show immediately. Like the only reason this guy's existing is because people don't know his name, right. but he still gets to slide into the club, do his set, you know, gets paid. And so now he's got his, you know, he's got his crappy manager and his flunky agent. And they're both telling him like, you got to, you got to do, do this. This is the biggest break of your life. That shows the number one show on TV. It's a number. You'll have the number one spot on the number one. And he's like, eh, I want to, but he's been saying to the manager the whole time, what are you doing? I, yeah. I can't, but where's my break? Give me a gig. Right, right. It's gonna, I mean, I, I, you gotta imagine there's people that are thinking about, thinking this way now, right? Like, yeah. Oh, sure. And like, like Brian said, you know, um, we don't know about the ones that did do that, did do the math because they didn't become a household name and they didn't get busted. Brian says the sack on the back of the neck works every time. That's that, what that, I that's heard. That's anecdotal. Well, that's he's what he's I only heard. talking about himself. That's right. <laughs> I can tell you from empirical evidence. Gina, hand on the crotch. I take your hand. I put on my crotch. Is that uh, is that ever going to? Uh, well, it, maybe it works in a in a domestic setting. I, I don't feel right. like it works in public, right? Um, it depends. I'm, I'm okay. What I'm doing in my head. Remember, you said like if it's if it's unwanted and the guy is not hot, it's always you know feel it's it's an assault. But if this is someone you're into, am I down? I even if he was super super hot and I was down, I would still be put off by that move. Mm. Because it, because that's mechanical. That's something he's done a hundred times. Yeah, yeah. Um, you can't go after a girl like Gina with self esteem. Thank who, who, you. Who, who self respect. You can't. You, mm -hmm. Well, I told target. you. I told you when I first moved here. I went on a date with that dude, and he. We sat on his futon because uh, couch was a uh, too uh, rich for his blood, and he whipped it out, <laughs> and he wouldn't let me out of his apartment. <laughs> So the, dudes do this. The futon is diabolical because if you have two glasses of wine, you can't get up off a that's, futon. You literally, you, you're essentially like a turtle. It's been flipped on its shell. There's that's no true. getting up from a futon. You're waiting for and, the kindness of strangers. And when you put the when you put the turtle's purse on the opposite side of the door, that's something. That's probably another move you've done before. You smartened up that time. Oh yeah! No way to get my purse. That's There's right. A move that works. Smart. Yeah, yeah that guy's a hero. <laughs> anyway. Sorry. Who else? Uh <laughs> what happened? Who's done what? Well, let's move on to Alec Baldwin and Hilaria. They welcomed their sixth child together. Oh. This is now Alec's seventh child. Only five months after she gave birth to their son Eduardo, uh, Hilaria broke the news on Instagram with a photo of little baby Lucia alongside Eduardo, Romeo Alejandro David, Leonardo Angel Charles, Rafael wow. Thomas, and Carmen Gabriela. Um, Staying with the Latin theme. Yeah, wow. yeah. Uh, so 
the math will tell you that this was probably a surrogate since this was, you know, five months after she had another baby. But in true Alec Baldwin fashion, standing by his woman colorfully, there was uh, a little um, back and forth on her, uh, you know, on the, the post from a fan who was questioning a lot of this and said, who is the mother? She wasn't pregnant. She gave birth six months ago. Uh, if it was a surrogate, just say that. If the baby was adopted, just say that. If the baby was the product of an affair and you've decided to raise it with your wife, just say that. If you don't want to say anything, person. if oh, yeah. there's more. If you don't want to say anything, why don't you stop constantly posting and begging for clickbait? Just oh, raise God. your hun- just raise your hundred children in private. <laughs> to which Alec replied, "You shut the fuck up and mind your own business." Yeah. yeah. I'm kind of with Alec on this one. I'm with Alec too. And I, and I, I want to post pictures of your kid, regardless of where they came from. There's yeah. no real obligation to tell people how you had the child. I, uh, you know, let's not forget, he was one of the early pioneers of almost being canceled with this piggy phone message mm-hmm. with his daughter, right? That was, yes, that was, um, oh, seven? I'm going to guess 2004 five or six because i remember i was when i heard that i think we were doing the morning radio i think i think i i think it would have been six or seven because i think we were doing the klsx show there and i do kind of remember where i was and it was like that was much ado about nothing i'm sure he was at his wits end with his crazy ex-wife and scheduling and like you know saying like i'll call you i'll pick you up at this time and she never picked up the phone and she was probably kim basinger was probably fucking with her head and he just went off because he's just you know he's that guy oh seven so says uh max zapata but it's like remember remember how we went nuts on that yeah. Called her like yeah. a disrespectful oh, a little piggy, yes. and, all, and also, uh, you're the product of Kim Basinger and Alec Baldwin. No, you're not going to be hurting in the looks department. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's just that's just a that's just a dad from the New York area teeing off on his on his daughter. And and he said, "Rude, thoughtless pig." Right. So that's where that that anger was coming from, not, you know, trying to destroy her self-esteem in the looks department. I was right. going to say, do we have a picture of this person these days? She got Ireland? Be... It, yeah, is this? A... I oh, saw her. I, she was at the roast. I hung out a little oh. with her at the roast. She's, you know, six foot three. and She's uh, I. Not in, look. I imagine so. Uh, yeah, if she's a pig, then uh, you should be hunting for truffles. <laughs> There you go. Yeah, she's a bit of all right. Uh, there's nothing. I don't think there's anything Kim Basinger can can produce that's going to f- slide below a, an eight. I think yeah. that I feel like that would be mathematically impossible. Have you seen most of her movies? <laughs> yeah, well, not in Rotten Tomatoes. All right, let me hit uh, Geico here. Do you own, do you rent your home? Well, you do one or the other, right? How about you get your bundle on with your automotive policy? Geico makes it easy. Just go to geico.com and uh, get a quote and see just how much you could be saving when you bundle your either homeowners or renters insurance with your automotive policy. You got so much to do. So free yourself up some time by getting your bundle on. Go to Geico. That is geico.com and get your bundle on today. All right, let's do another one, Gina. All right. Well, this one is uh, fantastic, and I can't wait to show you uh, the uh, the video. A plastic surgeon in California was multitasking his virtual traffic hearing so that he could do it while performing surgery. Wow. And the state medical board isn't super happy about it. Dr. Scott Green joined his Zoom trial in full surgical scrubs from the operating room and informed the other attendees that despite being in surgery, he could totally proceed with the trial. Uh, fortunately for the patient on the slab, the judge said, he would need to reschedule for when he wasn't literally cutting someone open. Here's a clip from the actual trial. It's it's pretty funny. So unless I'm mistaken, I'm seeing a defendant that's in the middle of an operating room appearing to be actively engaged in providing services to a patient. Is that correct, Mr. Green? Yes, sir. Or what I sh- should I say, Dr. Green, but I don't know okay. that. That's so, okay. Um, I do not feel comfortable uh, for the welfare of a patient, if you're in the process of operating, that I would put on a trial, notwithstanding the fact that the officer's here today. 
What's, so I have another I have another surgeon right here who's doing the surgery with me, so I can stand here and allow them to do the surgery also. Not at all. I'm I, I don't think so. I don't think that's appropriate. I think we're gonna have I'm gonna come up with a different date when you're not actively involved or participating in attending to the needs of a patient. Um, let me see if I can get a different date here. I kind of like the cut of this guy's jib. Is Which that just one? an F you to the cop, to the, the judge system? The yeah. He's giving him the hi-hat. Was he, <laughs> that was traffic? That was a traffic yeah. court thing? Yeah. Because yeah. the, the biggest insult to, and I don't know what the infraction was, but if it's a chicken shit infraction, the biggest insult, like rolling through a four-way stop sign on a Sunday or something like that, is that you got to like go in. Mm -hmm. You got to like put your shit aside and go to them, you know. Yeah. And uh, then if the cop doesn't show up, they'll dismiss it. But you have to sit there for a long time. I think I think the doctor was kind of like, I'm fucking busy. And again, if the if if the guy plowed through a farmer's market and uh, took out a Cub Scout troop. Uh, that's something. But if, 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 if it's a chicken shit kind of nuisance, time wasting a ticket, then good. Let the, uh, how, let the other doctor work on shit. But how would you feel if you were the guy with the anesthesia in your arm or you over your know. mouth? Well, <laughs> that's true. This must work to you now. Otherwise, what are you trying? <laughs> he said the other guy was working on him. Yeah, I don't know what that, two surgeons. I don't know what that means. And who the hell knows? Eh, it's an elective surgery, right? He's a plastic <laughs> surgeon. The guy he's was probably could have been skin graft from yeah. bomb victims. Right. Eh, he's probably getting a a a, 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 ta a sack tuck. Yeah. Or or it's more likely a foreskin restoration or something something you know a taxpayer's expense. Come on, <laughs> you want to pay for this guy's foreskin restoration, Gina? Well, do you? No, I don't. Brian, do you? Now that I think about it. All right, it, but yet yet this hero can't uh, conduct his business. Oh, it's interesting. <laughs> I have no idea. Uh, I haven't, I haven't gotten a ticket in a while because um, my head is on a goddamn swivel, and I've also figured out cop patterns. Mm -hmm. I don't think people, I don't, I don't think people fully like understand patterns and cop patterns. And I shall, uh, I shall give you a for instance. Uh, there is a red light. Um, I, obviously I drive through all red arrows, but I now drive through, I drive through a red light as well. And it's like at the end of my street and it's one of those little streets that goes out into the big street and it takes forever. And I drive through it every time because there's no cops. There's, there's no cops around. I mean, you could get unlucky, but you look right down the boulevard and you look left down the boulevard and you look in your rear view mirror. If you don't see any cops, you can just drive through. Now, as I always say, most people would never, ever do that, but they will happily go on a stretch of PCH on a beautiful day in Malibu and be driving at 63 miles an hour in a 45, you know, down the hill after you pass Pepperdine. And yep. that's where the cops are. Yep. The, the cops, away. they figured out patterns. They're, they're into patterns. They're not, they're not into going out and writing random tickets. They understand it's a long stretch of highway. People are looking at the ocean. You're like going down a hill. Or the, yep. the, by the stop sign at the bottom of the hill. The people always just because your momentum just always kind of roll through. There's a four way stop sign a block from here. Everyone here has gotten a ticket at that stop <laughs> sign because it's not that the cops are randomly driving by the intersection when you roll through it. They get it. That's what people they, do. Yep. Nobody but me drives through red, red lights. So there is no pattern. There's never a cop. If everyone did, then they would. But everyone, but but the the way people's brains are, is they would freak out if you go through a, a red arrow. But they have no problem sailing down PCH at 15 miles an hour, and right. that's where you get the fucking tickets all the time. So once you kind of understand, like kind of where the cops are like number one rule of where cops are downhill yes they're always they're not on the uphill side no. so speed on the uphill side and then slow it down on the downhill side 
They love to, like on the two freeway, they love to back it up. They love to be waiting on the on-ramp yeah, so always. you can't see them. And then you're just sailing down the hill. And they also know everyone's driving a modern car where 78 miles an hour on a clear day just feels like nothing when you're just barreling down the hill. But understand the rhythms of traffic cops. And then what you have to do is you can break all the fucking laws you want, but never sit, never do the California rolling stop through the four way stop sign. Exactly. That's where they are. And when yeah. you're on PCH and you pass Pepperdine and you're heading down that back hill, fucking for that, for that quarter mile or half mile, fucking slow it down. When I, I, I had must've been here a few years when I rolled through a stop on Western in East Hollywood, I had my car impounded. Really? Yes. It was very late at night. I was um, coming home from a friend's house. Eh, No, I'll tell you in a second. (laughs) I was um, I was coming home from a friend's house in Venice. I still had my suit on because this is when I was working in men's suiting, and I rolled through a stop of a dead neighborhood in East uh, Hollywood, and I got lit up by two women, and I couldn't find my license turns out i had a hole in the uh lining of my purse and mm. but i didn't know that at the time so they impounded my car they let they were going to leave me there in the middle of the night with all of the stuff they took out of my car and i said can you give me a ride home and they said that was against their policy and mm. somebody had to come get me so after begging and begging and begging these two women finally gave me a ride home my car was impounded for four days just literally because you couldn't produce a license i couldn't find it i was like i swear to god i have a license they, they took my they impounded me in the middle of the night yeah well good news is in los angeles that wouldn't happen anymore like you could get pulled over with no license no insurance <laughs> and like 10 duis in your past and they just go fuck it yeah, i did this backwards <laughs> All right, let's bring it home, baby. You got it. I'm Gina Grad, and that's the news. Gina, Gina Grad. That was the news with Gina Grad. Ah, last but not least, there is Simply Safe. You can set it up in 30 minutes. You don't have to worry about break-ins ever again. And you just go online to simplysafe.com slash Adam. Choose all the sensors you need, and uh, it'll show up at your door in about a week, and it'll be up and running your own custom system. And get a free security camera. At simplysafe.com slash Adam. All right. I'm going to label that show interesting. Mm-hmm. I'll lots, say. Lots of thoughts. Uh, I want to thank Paul Wagner for uh, zooming in. Uh, American Nightmare Season 2, of course. Ira Rosen as well. Ticking Clock, the book. And Reno, Virginia Street Brew House, March 19th and 20th, doing stand up there. Come on by. And uh, we're also doing the Jam in the Van out here on March 25th, two shows. And Dawson's going to be opening, and Adam Ray's going to be up there, too. So just go to amcurl.com for all that. And until next time, this is Adam for Ira and Paul and Gene and Bald saying, Mahalo. <laughs> <laughs>